Lord says to me, What do you see, Amos? I said, Tin. The Lord then said, Look, I am about to place tin among my people, Israel. I will no longer overlook their sin. Isaac's centers of worship will become desolate. Israel's holy places will be in ruins. I will attack Jeroboam's dynasty with the sword. Amos spoke to Amaziah. I was not a prophet by profession. No, I was a person who also took care of the sycamore fig trees. Then the Lord took me from tending flocks and gave me this commission. Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you please stand and sing the night of the God. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. 
For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture, the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you please stand and sing the Jubilee.
partly, there's, there's a couple of reasons. What I think it is one of the best passages in the Bible to actually walk someone through what the gospel is. Um, it's not always taught that way, but I think it can be very well taught that way. I've taught the gospel through it. I've tried to teach uh, people in the past, especially when I was working as a youth minister, to use this as kind of like a blueprint of how they can explain the gospel to other people. And uh, so I've always enjoyed it as a real gospel passage. And, and that's why, you know, it sometimes is disappointing. And, and, and I say this, and they, well, let me put it this way. When it is left to just simply being understood as a passage telling us, we need to be nice to other people, you're kind of missing some of the things that Jesus is saying. Not that we shouldn't be nice to one another, and we all can certainly take a lesson of being more neighborly and looking out to one another, but I don't believe that is Jesus' main point in this lesson, and I'm gonna to try to show that to you as we walk through the passage. Um, and it also, I can say it kind of is a witness to that, that that is, been the understanding of this particular passage from the earliest writings we have of people, because in the early church fathers, they wrote down their thoughts on this passage, going all the way back to people like Augustine, up to the Reformation, people like Martin Luther. The parable of the Good Samaritan was a preacher's best friend to teach the gospel. So, some things to note. Kind of like nature characters. First, we have a lawyer. And this parable is told to a lawyer. And I, I think I said two weeks ago when we looked at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, how important it is to put yourselves in the shoes of the guy who's listening to the parable. So we got to sit in the shoes of the lawyer and understand it, how Jesus is talking to him. He's an expert in the law of Moses. And he's a really good expert because when Jesus throws the question back at him, he's asking, you know, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what do I have to do to earn salvation? Jesus says, well, what does is, what is, what is the scripture say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. He's ready. He knows what the scriptures say, but... Most likely the Holy Spirit here, working in his heart, he realizes there's a problem. Have I truly loved my neighbor as much as I should have? And so he's obviously looking for a way to kind of wiggle on this particular situation because he's a lawyer, right? So he realizes, you know, technically any violation of this law would negate my being able to earn eternal life. Um, this is, and you can use this as a reference, goes back to what we were talking about last week. It's exactly what Paul is talking about in the epistle to the Galatians. When we look at what the law of Moses is, last week Paul used a really interesting term. He used the word the law of condemnation. And, and that sounds harsh, but what it means is the law of Moses doesn't redeem us. It tells us we need a redeemer. That's what God's law tells us. So this man is realizing he hasn't made the law. So when Jesus says, go and do likewise, at the end, He's saying to him, yeah, go and keep the law perfectly. That's not much help to the man, because he's already not kept the law perfectly, and he knows it. He can't be like the Samaritan. So it's a nice secondary application, as I said, to say we should be nice to one another, and we should be loving to one another. But that can't be the main point that Jesus is trying to teach him. He's trying to teach him that he's already messed up. He's already missed. The parable is here 
to show him that despite his best efforts, he's already fallen short. We all fall short because of our imperfections. So if we are not supposed to be the good Samaritan, who are we supposed to be? Well, according to pretty much anybody who is preaching this for the first 1,500 years of the church, we are the guy who gets beaten up. Jesus is the Good Samaritan, as we'll see in just a minute. Uh, and because nobody who is really reading through this parable thought Jesus was really trying to teach this man, you know, you really need to work hard to earn your salvation. That's not what Jesus says. That's not what Paul says. That's not even what the Old Testament says. We call on God's mercy. We don't force his hand by trying to achieve some kind of false perfection that we never could. What we need is someone who can go and do likewise on our behalf. We need a good Samaritan who can lift us up and rescue us. So this morning I want to share with you some of the things which makes this such a wonderful and popular uh, passage for pastors and for you if you have the opportunity to share this as a gospel message. First, what is our setting? Our setting doesn't jump out. I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background for it. Our setting is actually Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. We don't know that necessarily from Luke alone. We have some clues though. Uh, clue number one, if we're just looking at Luke, is we have a lawyer interrogating Jesus. Most of the time when we have somebody who's sitting around trying to trick Jesus, we're in Jerusalem. As for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come with their trick questions and we have it set up as a trick question as you saw in the beginning, but that's not our only clue. We have some other clues. One, when they leave here, they go to a place called Bethany. That's uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home on the outskirts of Jerusalem. That's a little later in Luke. Before this, we have Jesus feeding the 5,000 and sending out the disciples. That's also in the other Gospels, especially John will tell you that that's what happened just before Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths, which is also referenced in Luke. And so I can get into more. I'll just tell you, if you really want to study it, you can look at it in depth. We're in Jerusalem. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's really important because it was a time when all good Jewish men were supposed to be in Jerusalem, worshiping in the tabernacle. But then we have the man in Jesus' story. What does he do? He leaves Jerusalem and he goes to Jericho. And so this is a picture which is really meaningful if you know your geography of Jerusalem. Because the trip from Jerusalem to Jericho um, it's 17 miles, and if I just say 17 miles, that doesn't sound too bad. But if I tell you that 17 miles trip is 3,400 feet down, that should jump out at you. In other words, if you were imagine driving from Jerusalem to Jericho and it was a straight road, it would be a 26 degree decline or grade down over that 17 miles. You'd have warning signs all over the place. It's probably not that safe to be driving, but that's the whole 17 miles. So we're setting this picture up. The man is supposed to be in the highest point of the area, the temple at the highest mountain, Zion, in Jerusalem, worshiping the Lord at one of the feasts that Moses said, you're supposed to be in Jerusalem well, certainly they were supposed to be gathered together, but he's supposed to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of the Tabernacles. He's going down to 800 feet. Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. So it is certainly an example of a man leaving God and heading to hell. And along the way, the man is beaten up and left 
forget. He gets another really interesting picture. When we are lured away from God by the enemy, we think what he's whispering in our ears is treasure. We think what he's whispering in our ears is going to bring us joy. But not only do we find that it doesn't bring us joy, who are promised, but he, just as quickly, turns on us to tell us how worthless we are for leaving God, how God would never want us back because of our sinfulness and our worthlessness. It's one of the lies the enemy tells us time and time again, that it's not only to tell us the lie to get us to get away from God, but then to tell us a lie that God would never want us back. God receives repentant sinners. Turn to the Lord, turn away from your sin, and he will welcome you back. If you have any questions, read the book of Hosea. It's a wonderful picture of just how far God will go for his beloved. And that's us. Anyway, the man is left without on the side of the road, left for dead, and without any kind of external aid, he is going to die in that sin. So in this state, the man is passed by the priest and the Levite. And there's lots of uh, things you could talk about. Why does the priest and the Levite pass him by? I'm just going to tie it in mostly with what we've been talking about in relation to the law. If a priest and a Levite and not a joke, meaning here, but if a priest and a Levite, they're going to the temple to worship. What can they not do? They can't touch a dead body because then they would be ritually unclean. They wouldn't be able to go into the temple. They would have to perform like, like a week's worth of ritual, ritual cleansings before they could even approach worshiping the Lord in the temple, which means they would have to pee, they would have to miss the feast. So if they touch a dead body, or if they touch a live body that died while they were trying to help him, they couldn't go to worship God. They can identify that he's dying. They can identify that he's dead, and that's, that's what the law does. The law can tell us we're dying. We're dead in our sins and our trespasses. But the law can't heal us. And it's just such a wonderful picture there, tying it in with our gospel lesson. Leviticus 21.11, in fact, tells us that a priest was forbidden to even enter into a house that had a dead body in it. Not just touch it. He couldn't even go into a house that had a dead body. So, he's left on the side of the road, doomed to die. Who will help him? He needs an outsider. You need someone totally separate. And that's where the Samaritan comes in. The Samaritan has mercy on the one who is doomed to die in his present state. And what does he bring? Well, those are some of the clues. And I won't make as much if you want to read uh, St. Augustine. He loves to go into all of these in much more depth of all the items that Jesus lists here. But I will say this, certainly, throughout the scriptures, olive oil is a symbol of physical healing, not just in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, the book of James. James says for the pastors in the church to use olive oil to anoint the sick in the church. Wine is a symbol of blood, of covenant, Old Testament and New Testament, obviously a symbol of Christ's blood, and the oil and wine are biblical symbols of healing, of cleansing and bringing the man to life. Next, and there's, here's a word that sometimes gets missed, and it's one of those things that gets the, the phrase lost in translation. That's what I'm looking for. The word egero here in Greek, it means to raise up. It's the same word when it talks about God raising us up, uh, resurrect. The man is raised up on the donkey. The price for his recovery is paid for at the end. And the promise is given to the man that he will come again for him. 
So much wonderful symbolism of Christ. He's raised up. Christ raises us up. He pays the price for our redemption. And he promises that he will come again for us. And just, I guess, the capstone, as I said, this relates to what's going on after the feeding of 5,000 in John 6, and what's going on in John 7 and 8, and Jesus' trip there in the Feast of Booth. That's the only time in John's Gospel you see Jesus called a Samaritan. So I, I don't know if necessarily Jesus was calling himself the Good Samaritan in answer to the they were saying about him in there, but I think it's an, also an interesting tie in there. So hopefully you can see this is why so many have seen this as such a wonderful picture of the Gospel. Um, something which can be lost in kind of modern times when it, many churches have lost track of what the Gospel is about because the Gospel just simply melts down to being nice to one another. And there's nothing wrong with being nice to one another. It's good to be nice to one another. That's not what Jesus is trying to teach us. Not, let me phrase it that way. Let me retract that. That's not the main point that Jesus is trying to teach us. Yes, be nice to one another. And be nice to one another, especially in being true to the gospel. And saying that we are sinners. And it is not nice when you tell someone who is going to hell, everything is just A-OK -okay and all right. That is not being nice. Um, so the whole point uh, can be missed when we just focus on what the world says is what it is to be nice. And anyway, I think this is why it's also, when you see this come up every year, it's always paired with that mess passage we read from Galatians. And there again, Paul says there, in, in reference to the law, the Pharisees, the Pharisee, not the Pharisee, the Levite and the priest, Paul says in Galatians, if a law could be given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Let's think about what that says. If righteousness could be if the law could be given that could give life, righteousness would be given by the law. But the law can't make you alive. The scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. And that's why I say the point of the parable is not we need to keep the law perfectly. It's we repent and we by faith receive Christ Jesus and by receiving Christ Jesus and believing in him we receive true redemption so this gospel message shows us without Christ we are like that man dead spiritually physically dying abandoned but Christ seeks us out. He brings healing to our wounds, raises us up, and brings us to be with him after healing us. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you that you have brought us healing, that you have raised us from the dead spiritually to give us everlasting life. We call on you, Lord, as those who have fallen. Help us, Lord, to see the sins in our lives, to truly repent of them. Lord, be with us, Lord, now as we continue our worship before your throne. Hear our praise, hear our prayers, and may your gospel be truly preached through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue the singing in the cross of Christ our Lord.
Our Lord Jesus Christ has told us it is our blessed to give and to receive. Let us now continue our worship at the giving of his tithes for all. Spirit of your grace. 
and that they may truly please you, pour upon them the continual dew of your blessing. This morning we pray especially for the Atlantic City Rescue Mission. We pray for your gospel to be clearly preached by all your ministers. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving help unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your holy church, universal, that it may be guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, in all the faith and unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or state, especially for those for whom our prayers are desired. We lift before you, Lord, Marge, and we pray for her recovery and healing, as well as George. We pray, Lord, for peace in the Middle East, especially Ukraine and Gaza. We pray for peace between Ukraine, sorry, Israel and Gaza, Ukraine and Russia, for Larry and his cancer, for Debbie, Chuck, John, Maria, George, Marion, Pat, Rosemary and Margaret, for Chuck Jr., the McQuaid and Casanova's families, for Heather and her family and their safe return, for Steve, Clarissa, Susie, Scott, Mary, Chris, Zach, for William Clemenson, and thank you, Lord, for his traveling down today. We pray you'll give him a safe journey back home to Brick. For Nelson Riley, Walt, and Pat Stewart, for Angela, and for all those, Lord, who are upon our hearts in need of your care, your comfort, and your gospel. That it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their suffering necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings, and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. In this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we your unworthy servants give you humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love, the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of the Lord. And we pray, give us such an awareness of all your mercies, that our hearts may be truly thankful, and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we with you and the Holy Spirit, we all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which you have asked in faith according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Be with us all evermore. Amen. Our closing hymn is Amazing Grace.
minds and the knowledge and love of God and the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.